Well, I'm sure you have been bursting with a desire to hear today a message about stewardship. <laughs> so you are about to get your wish. Yes. You know, the, the looks of an unspeakable joy on your faces just does my heart a world of good. <laughs> Well, the passage we heard today comes from all the suggestions of how to live your life, or commandments, or I would say uh, ways of being in connection with God, living the, God, the way God wants us to live, it comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And before that, before the, the, the uh, reading we had, there are two that are important that I will uh, bring them here too. One is concerning treasures. And it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the other one is from you know, serving to masters. No one can serve to masters, but a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. So here we, we have this sermon about stewardship in general. And many of us sometimes, uh, you know, uh, don't understand stewardship. We, we think it's all about money. But no, stewardship is not about your money. It's about your life. The stewardship is about how you manage your time, your energy, your talents, your treasure. And it is about giving God the best of who we are and of what we have received. We are called to be good stewards of all that God gives us and to bring to God each and every day of our lives. And Matthew 6, 21 says, Where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Stewardship. Stewardship is about uh, who is in charge of your life. Exodus 22 says, You shall have no other gods before me. So stewardship is what a person does after he or she says, I believe. We show God that He is first in our lives when we give God the best of who we are and what we have possessed. The story about uh, John D. Rockefeller that uh, that after some, after shortly after his uh, death, his chief financial advisor said, "You know, he was one of the richest men in the world," and he was asked. Oh, well, how much did he leave? And the advisor replied or answered, well, everything. He left everything. And God would have us remember that we all leave everything when we die. Again, do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves, treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Steve Farrar, a family survival in the American jungle, uh, says that we are infected with a cultural disease, disease is called affluenza. You know, in 1918, some 548,000 Americans died of what we know as the flu. Uh, 
today influenza is no longer a threat, but influenza is. And here are the symptoms of influenza, in case you, you need to treat them and recognize them. Desire more for desire for more and more despite what you already have. Insatiable drive to be successful without ever experiencing contentment. Practice of consistently choosing career over family. Unchecked yearning for more positions of wealth. Unwillingness to settle for less than the best of everything. Sure, you don't have one side. You, you look healthy to me. One anonymous poet said, possessions, possessions weigh me down in life. I never feel quite free. I wonder if I own my things or if my things own me. You know, Christ, and this is interesting, talks about money and giving and stewardship more than any other topic, more than any other, you know, the sins that we hear in the Bible. And he talks about a great deal about materialism. And Christ warns us about materialism more than he, than he did any other sin. Jesus isn't saying you cannot have a nice house, a good car, you know, a great big check. What he's saying is life does not consist of possessions only. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. That's very true. <clears throat> we have materialism and greed everywhere. We see it each day through the ads we we will look at each and every day. You know that we are faced with more than uh, 5,000, they said 5,800 ads that we see every day, not only on TV, but on the radio, papers, billboards, that talk about things like uh, materialism. Well, let me tell you a story. A husband and wife, they were attending a county fair where <clears throat> for $20, a person, a man was giving, <clears throat> giving rides in an old airplane. But the couple, you know, the couple wanted to go up, but they thought, you know, $20 a person? Yeah, that's kind of expensive. So they tried to negotiate a lower price with the pilot, and, he's, and they said, well, we'll pay you $20 for both of us. They said to the pilot, and the pilot said, ah, no, I don't know. Well, after all, you know, if we pay twenty dollars for both of us, we'll we'll squeeze into that tiny cockpit, which is all the bill for only one person. So the pilot refused to lower his fare, but he made a counter offer. He suggested, you know, pay me the full price of twenty dollars each, and I'll take you up. If you don't say one word during the flight. I'll give you all your money back. The couple agreed and got into the plane. So up they went, and the pilot proceeded to perform, you know, every trick he knew. Look, picking, and whirling, and flying upside down, and, and lots more. And finally, when the plane had landed, the pilot said to the husband, congratulations, here's your money back. You didn't say a single word. To which the man replied, Nope, but you almost got me when my wife fell off. <laughs> Stewardship is managing one's house or managing the affairs of another. We often speak of our possessions, but according to the Bible, God owns it all. 
and we owe nothing. We are stewards of everything God entrusts to us. We have because God gave it to us in the first place. Because God's grace makes it possible. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So we are stewards, not owners. Thus giving our time, our talent, our treasure is nothing more than managing God's resources. It all belongs to God. I'm sure you're asking, well, you know, but how do we build treasures here on earth? Or how do you store up treasures in heaven? I was reading a book by Bill Hybels, and <clears throat> he was talking about stewardship too, and he, he lists three important de uh, deposits in our, you know, in our heavenly bank account. Let's say we, we have a heavenly bank account, so we, we have three deposits. And the first one says worship. One joy-filled investment plan is the commitment to be a regular and passionate worshiper. Worship is never wasteful in the eyes of God. Because every act of private and corporate worship is a deposit in your heavenly bank account. And he also adds, not only does worship move and delight the heart of God, it helps restore our perspective of what is truly valuable in this life. The second deposit is Christ-like character. The Bible clearly teaches us that if we want to lay up treasure in heaven, one of the best investment strategies is personal character development. We should make every attempt to strengthen our character in a, in a way that honors God. Because each time we do this, it is a deposit in our heavenly bank account. This is expressly with uh, crystal clarity in Peter, 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9, with the, with the words. Finally, all of you, Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So every time we choose love over hate, kindness over harshness, empathy over insensitivity, Truth-telling over lying, forgiveness over grudge, bearing, a polite spirit over rudeness, silence over slander, wisdom over foolishness, purity over immorality, faith or generosity over stinginess. We delight the heart of God and add to our heavenly portfolio. And the deposit three, bank account, expressions of generosity. Every time we show an act of compassion, we build up our treasure in heaven. You know, it might seem a very small kind of uh, um, act of kindness, but it counts. You know, others might look at that tiny, small kindness and, and chuckle at our efforts. They might even say that we can't make a difference. But Jesus calls us to express his love, kindness, and compassion to those around us, to those in need. And when we do, we are storing up treasures in heaven. Now, I'm going to qualify what I'm, what I'm saying here, what I would like to say next. I've heard of churches where, you know, folks complain that only 20% of the people do 80% of the work. We have heard, you have heard that. But I think that's not true here. 
That's not true here. Here it is more like 40 or 50. Maybe I'm wrong. That's what I've seen. 40 or 50 percent of the people doing the bulk of the work. And the thing is, I brag, I brag about you all the time, wherever I go. And so, understand I'm not saying this next part for any other reason that I believe it to be true. The problem for many churches is that a lot of folks feel their whole purpose as a Christian is to show up and sit down and shut up and listen. <laughs> no, seriously. And we kind of, you know, condition ourselves to that mindset by how churches are set up. You know, and this is interesting because we're all sitting in pews in the sanctuary and then all the pews here are facing who? Me, towards me, right? It gives me the, it gives you the impression that church, it's all about coming and listening to me. Now, I have to admit, I like that. <laughs> it gives me something to talk to. But if you do come, <laughs> sit down and listen. I have a question for you this morning. Is that all you do? About your life of faith? Is that all you do? Now, I understand some of you are physically unable to do all things. And I understand that. And you've done your you know, you've done, you've sacrificed, you've worked hard. And I'm not talking about church, but you've worked hard at reaching out to people, whether you have worked, you know, as a volunteer or, you know, you have worked in those specific jobs that help others. I understand that. But those who are physically able, what's your excuse? You know, just like in every church, some, some of us, some of you come, just come, sit, and get entertained. But is, is there something else you could do? And you don't because it is, that's not your job. Let me start just with the simple stuff. You know, do you make it a point to meet people here? and get to know their names, and know who's who, and be hospitable to them. Have you ever volunteered to make coffee or refreshments between church and Sunday school? Do you volunteer in the nursery or uh, Sunday school? Sometimes not to teach, but just be there. Do you volunteer to help with communion? Have you ever done <coughs> Or with the offering? Not just the serving, but the preparing of the plates for worship time. How about more intense things? How many of you can drive? You know, we have only one person doing the bus ministry, but maybe you could make yourself available to help at times our driver can be there. Or you could drive someone to church. You know, there are many of our brothers and sisters who do not drive because they can't drive anymore. It's kind of dangerous for them. So why not offer your driving skills to bring them once a month, twice a month? And if they are in your neighborhood, why not come with them? Plan for that. You know, would you be willing to preach? You could do it. Would you be willing to teach Sunday school part time? How how about the sound booth there? I mean, we have these volunteers day in and day out. What about giving them, you know, a break? I'm sure that we would be very very happy to train you to do that. You know, I could go on and on and on, but the point is we all 
We all, with no exception, have something we can do. Are you doing it? Are you being a servant? Or you're just here to be served? You know, nobody, nobody ought to ask us or beg us to serve. Because we, we should step, we ought to step forward and volunteer for the simple reason that God is good all the time. If we're never recognized, that's okay, that's all right. We're not serving for recognition or rewards. We are serving because God has been good to us and is still good all the time. You know, how we feel about the pastor isn't even important. What's it's important is that we render service to a God that is good all the time. That's why we are ushering at the door, you know, taking abuse as a leader or making sacrifices as a member or working till late at night on special projects, co cooking in the kitchen, volunteering in the school, taking time with the young, caring for the sick, sending letters or postcards to those who haven't been here, strengthening, strengthening the faith of the discouraged because God has been good to us all the time. Are we building up treasures in heaven? Well, I mentioned three kind of bank accounts. I would like to add one more at the deposit number four. How we build up treasures in heaven is leading others to Jesus Christ. Leading others to Jesus Christ. I imagine, you know, when you get to heaven, it's going to be a great joy to see all those with whom you share the gospel. That will be a sight to see. It might be your children, your friends, your neighbors, other relatives, even the lady who waited, you, who waited on you, your table at your favorite restaurant, or a fellow behind the counter at the convenience store. You know, wouldn't it be great to hear, oh, I, I am here because you share your love of Christ with me. Peter calls our deposits an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fail. Kept in heaven for you. So, let me ask you this. What are you holding on onto with your hands? How's your grip? Is it good? Maybe on a personal level, we've been in acquisition mode rather than relinquishing mode our entire life. Remember that anything we try to hang on to here will be lost. We'll each part with our possessions some money. The only question is when? We can keep earthly treasures for the moment. And we may even derive some temporary enjoyments from them. But if we give them away, if we give them away, we'll enjoy eternal treasures that will never be taken from us. This is what Jimmy Elliot meant when he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Remember, whatever, that whatever owns you, whatever owns you is that what you will serve. So my advice to you this morning is hold tightly to the things of God and loosely to the things of the world. If you are really serious about laying up treasures in heaven, then it starts here on earth. Because heavenly <coughs> living begins here. And it is completed in heaven. 
The important thing to remember is this principle of stewardship. God owns, we manage. Because we are stewards of what God entrusts to us, to our care. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is as well. So invest your talents, your treasures, your, your gifts, your time, your energy this week. Invest them in the best way you can and serve Jesus. Because when we put our faith into practice, we are building up treasures in heaven.